Hey, Pastor, and what a joy to see each of you out on this uh, blustery evening in January. And uh, wouldn't be winter time without a little wind, a little cold. But uh, thank you for braving all the elements and making it through the day and your way back to God's house tonight. Take your Bible. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians and the third chapter. Look at one verse as our text, but keep your Bible open to this area of God's Word as we'll look at several verses tonight in and around our text. Galatians chapter 3. I call your attention to verse 13. Verse 13 of Galatians 3 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. The created soul, fallen to the curse of sin, is in desperate need of a compassionate Savior. This is why our theme for 2021 is not declare the church. It is not declare a movement. It is not declare religion. It is not declare reformation. It is not declare change. Our theme is declare the gospel. The only remedy to the, ca- the curse of sin is a compassionate Savior. We sometimes think, well, if, if we could just fix this. You know, if, 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 if culture could just get this right, then, then we'd be okay. Everything would be fine. If we just had enough money to do this, if we could just elect him or her, if we could just pass this law, everything would be okay. We need to comprehend tonight that there is no other hope but Jesus Christ. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Jesus' command to us as he left this earth was, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the answer. That's the remedy. That's the solution. And the sooner we understand that, the more energy we can give to what God has left us here to do. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria, what did he do? He preached Christ unto them. When Philip saw the Ethiopian eunuch there in his chariot and came up to him and said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he, and he desired Philip to come up and sit with him. And the Bible says Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. When Saul of Tarsus was saved on the road to Damascus, the Bible tells us, and straightway, that is immediately, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul said, We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. We must declare the gospel. We must preach a compassionate Savior. Three requ- uh, re- requisites tonight for declaring a compassionate Savior. First of all, let's back up a little bit in our minds because we cannot emphasize it too much because it is the premise from which we work with respect to declaring the gospel. I want you to see, first of all, tonight an irrefutable fall. Now, we talked yesterday about sin. We talked how sin ruined this creation of God. And we, 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 we went over and over, verses after verses about the fact that man is cursed in his sin. But we've got to understand that tonight. You see, we don't like to think of ourselves as human beings as deficient. 
We, we don't like to look at ourselves as lost. We don't like to think in terms of the fact that we have a need. In fact, man thinks that, that there's a germ of good in all of us. But we've got to understand this concept of sin. The whole Rogarian philosophy of counseling is that there's a, a germ of good in every person and the, and the point of the counselor or the point of the church or the point of the person who's trying to help is to somehow find that little germ of good and water it and nourish it and, and let, it, let it spring up and overtake the person. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, there is none good, no, not one. We've got to understand this concept of sin. When God looks at the human race tonight, he says their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not innocent until proven guilty with God. We are guilty until proven innocent by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are sinners from the sole of our foot to the top of our head. There is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They're not closed. They're not bound up. They're not mollified with ointment. Do we understand what sin is? 1 John 5, 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. Now, it would be hard to argue against the fact that God is righteous. God is holy. God is perfect. He is without sin. He is sinless. So God is the standard of righteousness. And God says that all unrighteousness is sin. So let me ask you something. Do you think that God ever has a lustful thought? So why don't we call that sin? If God never has a lustful thought, then a lustful thought is unrighteous. But see, we just kind of think, well, that's in my mind. Nobody, nobody's hurt by it. I'm talking to Christians now. Do you think God ever allows himself to come under the influence of alcohol? You think God smokes a little weed? It takes some pressure off to calm him down, escape realism? Then why aren't we willing to call those things sin? We, we want to just kind of gloss over our, our habits, our, our enjoyments, and, and, and our lusts, and our passions, and we just want to, we, we don't want to call that sin. We don't want to understand this concept of sin. Do you think God ever gets proud? Do you think he ever is selfish? Do you think God ever criticizes or becomes jealous? Do you think God is enamored with material things? Do you think God is, 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 is someone who lies or is lazy? Or perhaps in his speech is, is crude or, or crass or vulgar? Do you think God harbors any bitterness or unforgiveness? 
Do you think God ever becomes abusive? Do you think God ever contemplates suicide? So why are these acceptable things in our life? We want victory. We want success. But I'm afraid that many of us look at this concept of sin as some kind of a, kind of a, a vague sort of theological cloud. And yeah, I'm a sinner. But we never think about sins. There's a song we sing a lot and we always sing it wrong. It's called Victory in Jesus. And the chorus says, then I repented of my sins. It's hard to sing it in the plural, but that's the way it's written. We, we kind of have this idea that, well, uh, sin is kind of this abstract thing and, and, and it really doesn't, it doesn't apply to anything really in my life. It's just, yeah, I'm a sinner and I repented of my sin. When's the last time we repented of our sins? When's the last time we took a look at the unrighteousness in our life, that which leaves us destitute of God? Friends, we are sinners tonight. We've got to get in our minds and hearts the concept of sin, that we have fallen. We are under the curse. And that sin curse, not only do we see the concept of sin, but we see the conveyance of that sin. We inherited that sin nature, that curse of sin. It was passed down, as we saw from Adam yesterday, Why, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. We all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. By nature, we are cursed. We are sinners. We are under the curse of God. I was shapen in iniquity, David said. In sin did my mother conceive me. Not only does the Bible teach us the concept of sin and the conveyance of sin, but he lets us know about the condemnation of that sin. The wages of sin is death. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. There's the eternal curse because of sin. An irrefutable fall. No one can argue tonight that we are a fallen creature under the curse of sin. A created soul, a soul that is going to live somewhere forever, has come under this curse of sin, an irrefutable fall. And we have, secondly tonight, an insufficient funding. See, see here's the... Here, here's the way we think. We think, well, if there's a deficiency, then let's make up the deficiency and we'll be okay. In other words, if, 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 you're, if your checkbook looks a little bleak tonight and there's a little you know, deficiency in your account and, and, and maybe you've even gotten a notice of insufficient funds, well, what do you do? Well, you, you try to get some overtime or you try to get a second job. You, you, you try to solve the problem. If, if there's something insufficient, then, then we try to make up for it somehow. We work harder. We, we try to be better. We, we try to be more religious. We, we see, okay, yes, I, I, I'm a sinner. I've, I've fallen from God. I'm under this curse of sin. But, but perhaps I can, I can somehow make up for it. We suppose that since the curse came from breaking the law, then if the law could be kept, the curse is lifted. But the law of God would need to be kept personally. Sometimes when people realize they're a sinner, they say, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start going to church. I'll get involved in a church. 
And if I'm religious, if I'm a part of a church, then that, that church will, will kind of cover this problem I have. It will make up for this deficiency. But the law has to be kept personally. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All of us are individually responsible for ourselves. Just because you're in Bible college doesn't solve the problem of sin. Just because you're in a Christian school doesn't mean that the problem of sin is somehow wiped away. The law would have to be kept personally. It would have to be kept perfectly. You see, whenever our righteousness is challenged, what do we do? If, if somebody says, hey, you ought not to do that. Uh, that, that. That shouldn't be a part of your life. Or if somebody challenges our righteousness, what do we do? We counteract that challenge with, well, okay, but, but look at all these things I am doing. Right? We, 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 try to, we try to cover up this, this area over here that's deficient. We cover up this area that the Bible calls sin by saying, yeah, but look at all these good things I do. But the law has to be kept perfectly. If the law could save, it would have to be kept perfectly. The Bible says in James 2 and verse 10, Whoso keepeth the law and yet offend in one point... He's guilty of all. So if we've broken the law in one point, no matter how many other points we keep, we're still a lawbreaker. Because the law is a whole. The law is a unit. And so to break the law in one point is to break all of the law. That's why God says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. You see, we'd have to keep the law perfectly. I was witnessing to a young man some time back, and he was, uh, we were talking about the sin nature and the fact that we're all sinners. And he said, yeah, I'm, but he said, I, I try to be good sometimes. He said, uh, for instance, he said during Lent, and it was, it was Lent season, and he said during Lent, he said, I... Um, I drink light beer instead of my regular beer. I thought, well, God's probably really impressed with that. You're, you're really making a sacrifice there. But, but isn't that our nature? Isn't that the way we think? Well, yeah, I, I've got some of these problems you mentioned a minute ago, Brother Gash, but, but I'm in church on Monday night. I, I, I teach a Sunday school class. I, I, I sing in a special group. I, I go to Christian school. I'm a Bible college student. And we think that, well, I, I'm, I'm keeping most of the law. But if the law was going to save us, you'd have to keep it personally. You'd have to keep it perfectly. And you would have to keep it perpetually. Look at verse 10 in Galatians 3. He says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse... For it is written, cursed is everyone, there's the personally, that continueth not, there's the perpetually, in all things, there's the perfectly, which are written in the book of the law to do them. You see, if righteousness could come by something we could do, if righteousness could come by some action on our part, it would have to be personal, it would have to be perfect, it would have to be perpetual. Which shows us very clearly that we have an insufficient funding. We have indeed come short of the glory of God. So then that leaves us with our only hope. We are part of a human race which has suffered an irrefutable fall. As we look at the word of God, we recognize in ourselves humanly we have insufficient funding to make up for that fall. So what then are we left with? And that is an indebtedness forgiven. Look at chapter 3 and verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident 
For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not a faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. So erasing the cause of our own, on our own, to erase the, the curse of sin on our own, the Bible says it's impossible. He says it's evident. So we find in verse 13 a proper substitute. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, Amen. being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. The Bible is clear that we're sinners and there's a punishment for that sin. And we can't pay it. We, we don't have sufficient funds to pay the price for our sin. But God provided a Savior who did so. Amen. Jesus Christ. A proper substitute. Way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, God came to a man named Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac. I want you to offer him on Mount Moriah as a sacrifice. I'm not sure how Abraham received that message initially. Remember, Abraham was 99 years old when Isaac was born. He was the promised seed. He was the answer to God's promise and the covenant to Abraham that Abraham would become the father of multitudes. He'd become the father of nations. And Abraham miraculously, along with Sarah, bore Isaac. And now Isaac is a young man God says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. It's interesting, Abraham, I think, must have struggled with this because he did not tell Isaac about it. He did not tell Sarah about it. He did not tell his servants about it. He merely gathered some servants along with Isaac and said, we're going to go to Mount Moriah and offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And they begin the journey. And I can't even imagine the tension in Abraham's heart as he wrestled with this command of God. How can this be? How can God promise a son, deliver on the promise, and then say now, kill your son? How can God perpetuate a nation through my son if he's dead? Abraham had to be wrestling with all of this. And the Bible says they went three days' journey. So this was not like, you know, a five-minute car ride out to do something. This was a three-day journey. And Isaac is in this, or Abram's in this turmoil. No one else knows what he's going through. But they get to the foot of that Mount Moriah, and Abraham says to the servants, you stay here while the lad and I go yonder, and we will return thither. By this time, we know Abraham's got it settled. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham had become convinced that if God was going to require Isaac as a sacrifice, then God would have to raise him from the dead because God had promised that through that son would come a nation. So Abraham's God is settled in his mind. Okay, God's telling me to kill him, but God's going to have to raise him from the dead. That's going to be exciting because God's going to keep his promise. But he still hasn't told Isaac. So now Abraham and Isaac are walking up this mountain alone. And I don't know how far they got up the mountain, but Isaac, he says, uh, Dad, uh, we have the wood and we have the fire, but where is the lamp? Dad, you're, you're, you're getting old. And you're forgetful sometimes. And I just want to tell you before we get too far here, we've got wood, we've got fire, but we don't have a sacrifice. You remember what Abraham said? He said, son, 
God will provide for himself a lamb. Oh, man. What a picture. What a picture. And you know, so many people in this world tonight are looking for the sacrifice. What can I do? If we're honest, we know we're sinners. Lord, I go to church, but it doesn't seem to be enough. Lord, I try to be good, but I can't. Lord, I have wood, I have fire, but where's the lamp? And you can go home and read the story. God did provide a lamb that day. Caught in the thicket. God provided the sacrifice. Many, many, many hundreds of years later, John the Baptist, as he was baptizing by the river Jordan, looked up and he saw Jesus Christ coming to him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. God provided for himself a lamb. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb slain without spot and without blemish, God has provided the sacrifice. He's provided the lamb. And that is the gospel. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, a payment was submitted Turn back a page if you need to to Galatians chapter 1. And look at verse 3. Paul in this greeting to this church at Galatia says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, comma. Who? Who's the who? Just before the comma. The greeting. Jesus Christ, who? Who? Gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. The payment is submitted here. The payment for our sin, the payment for this curse that has come upon the human race, the payment is none other than the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus declared, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cried unto thee in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and they were delivered. They cried, and thou didst deliver them. But I am a worm, and no man. A reproach of men, despised of the people. All they that pass by shoot out the lip. They mock, saying, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him if he'll have him. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melteth in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, for thou hast brought me to the dust of death. Many dogs have enclosed me. The assembly of the wicked have encircled me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They stare and look upon me. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. A payment is being submitted, ladies and gentlemen. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Scourging was a common form of punishment in Jesus' day. When someone committed a crime, the Jews would take the crime, the criminal, and strip him down to his waist. They'd make him bend over an object like this and expose his back. And then they would take this leather strap with a sharp object attached to it, usually a piece of iron or a piece of glass, sometimes a a bone or a shell. They would take this flogging tool, this scourging instrument, and with the back exposed, they would take that that tool and they would put stripes upon the back of this one who had committed a crime. 
the Jews had a limit to how many stripes they could place upon the back of a criminal. Their limit was 39 stripes. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 said of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five different times for preaching the gospel, Paul came under the Jewish scourge of 40 stripes, save, minus one, 39 stripes, maximum penalty. But our Bible tells us that Jesus was not scourged by the Jews. He was turned over to the Romans for scourging. Roman history tells us the Romans had no limit. They had no maximum penalty. In fact, history records that the Romans would often scourge a man as many as 150 times. When my wife and I went to Israel back in 1975, we were taken one day down into a basement-like room. There was nothing in the room. It felt like we were underground, which we were. It felt like we were almost in a cave. It, it was sort of hewn out of stone. There was no furniture in the room. There was, there was nothing there. I remember walking in there thinking, what are, what are we seeing here? The room was only about 12 by 12, maybe square. Guy came in. He said, you're probably wondering what we're looking at here. And I certainly was. He said, this was a room that was used by the Romans for scourging. He said, we don't know if this is the exact place where Jesus was scourged. There are about 12 of these rooms in and around Jerusalem. This is the closest to Golgotha. So it could be the very place. He said, when the Romans would scourge a man, they would bring him down into this room. And they would remove all of his clothing. He said, look at the ceiling. We looked up and in the ceiling, there was a beam cut into that rock. It came down maybe four or five inches across three or four inches. It spanned the entire width of that room. In that beam, there were two holes cut, arms width apart. The guide said after they would strip the person of all of his clothing, they would take leather bands, attach one to each wrist, and pull the body upward to these two holes cut in the beam of that ceiling. Now with the body stretched upward and naked, those Roman soldiers would take what they called a cat of nine tails, a rod, with nine pieces of leather attached to that rod. At the end of each piece of leather, a sharp object, as I described a minute ago. Now with the body stretched upward and naked, these Roman soldiers would take that rod and they would whip that body in that stretch position, the leather cords would wrap around the body. The sharp objects would bite into the skin. And the skill of that Roman soldier, as soon as that shell or piece of iron or glass would pierce the skin, they would rip it away, pulling the skin from off of the body, exposing the very organs. Imagine 150 The guide said, look at the floor. We looked down and directly beneath that beam in the ceiling, there was a gutter cut into that floor. And the guide said, that was so the blood could flow out of the room. There's a payment being submitted. The Bible says after they'd scourged him, they led him out to a place called Praetorium. Sometimes in the scriptures called the Common Hall was here that they stripped him of his raiment, placed around him a purple robe, plaited a crown of thorns. Those thorns still grow in Israel to be three, two and a half inches in length. When they had plaited a crown of thorns, they placed it upon his head. They put a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they took that reed and smote him on the head, driving those thorns down into his skull. Now with his eyes blindfolded, those soldiers took turns with an open hand, slapping him across the face, pulling the blindfold up and saying, who just hit you? 
Come on, you're supposed to be God. Who just hit you? You're no God. And they pull the blindfold down and slap him again and again and again. And this went on and on and on and on. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off from him and let him out to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man of Serene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. There were seven different styles of crosses used at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. The most common was in the form of a capital T. Unlike the small letter T cross that we associate with Christianity. This capital T cross, according to Roman records, weighed in totality 325 pounds making it virtually impossible for any man to carry. But Roman history tells us that the center posts of those crosses, which weighed 200 pounds, was left in the places of execution, places like Golgotha, to be used over and over and over. But the cross piece, which weighed 125 pounds, was cut individually for each one that was to be crucified. And it was customary for the one who was condemned to carry that cross piece to the place of execution. However, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that Simon of Cyrene carried that cross piece of wood. When they got to the top of Calvary, they took that 125 pound plank of wood and laid it on the ground. They took the battered, bleeding, and bruised body of our Savior and placed him back onto that cross, stretching his arms outward on that piece of wood. They took Roman spikes five to seven inches in length. They found the slight separation between the two main bones in the wrist. There they would puncture the skin and then pound those nails through his hands to that piece of wood. Once the hands were fixed, They would lift that cross piece up to that center post and lock it into position. They then would bend the knees slightly, cross the ankles, and punch one spike through the feet into that center post. The legs were bent slightly. If a person was crucified with his legs Locked, his knees locked. Gravity would pull him down on that cross. Air would fill his lungs, but he would be unable to exhale and thus suffocate within moments and die. Crucifixion was not meant to be instantaneous like an electric chair execution or lethal execution of today. It was meant to be carried out for hours, sometimes days. So they bent the legs slightly. So the person on that cross could push and pull on those nails upward to take in air. As gravity would pull back down, the air would expel. But in order to continue to survive, he had to push and pull upward in order to breathe or to speak. And Jesus did speak seven times. Father, Forgive them. They know not what they do. And finally, from that cross, he cried To tell us, die. It is finished. Payment submitted and accepted. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he shall be cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people is he stricken, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to make his soul an offering for sin. A promise secured. Look at verse 13 again. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. A promise secured. Salvation. In fact, look down at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by that law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, that law was our schoolmaster, our teacher, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, but you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. What does the law teach us? It teaches us we can't keep it. We're cursed. We're sinners, and there's no funding within ourselves. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There's nothing in us that can somehow earn or merit this salvation. No, no. The law was merely a schoolmaster. It was merely a teacher to show us you're insufficient. You need a savior. And it is only by faith in Jesus Christ that you and I can have that payment secured. That promise of eternal life secured in our hearts forever. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My friend, tonight listening to me, it is our only hope. It is our only remedy from the curse of sin. And if you've never accepted that payment that Jesus Christ has already paid for you, oh, tonight, run to Jesus. Run to Christ. Run to this wonderful Savior. Christian, that's why we declare the gospel. It's not an option. It's an obligation. It is our conscience. It is our command. It is our cause. Paul said, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, but necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Would you come tonight and receive this compassionate Savior? Sinner, would you find that payment in Christ tonight? Would you trust him? Would you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that thou shalt be saved? Come to this Savior tonight. Christian, will you tell somebody about him this week? Will you get the good news to someone this week? I wonder who in this room would give their life to declare the gospel. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. How can we settle for anything but that command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This world, oh, they think they can solve the problems with this and that. But the answer is a compassionate Savior. We are a created soul that is going to live somewhere forever. 
But that soul of Adam had a choice and he made the choice to disobey God. And when he did, the curse of sin came upon the entire human race. And the only hope we now have is a compassionate Savior. And that's the only hope your neighbor has. It's the only hope your mom and dad have. It's the only hope your boss has. It's the only hope our enemies have is a compassionate Savior. We must, we must, we must declare the gospel.